Hello, and welcome to the teacher edition of Steve Barkley Ponders Out Loud. The complexity of teaching is both challenging and rewarding, and my curiosity is piqued whenever I explore with teachers the multiple pathways for facilitating student engagement in the exciting world of learning. This podcast looks to serve teachers as they motivate and support their learners. Thanks for listening. I'm delighted that you're here. What's in your grade book? As a teacher, whether in my first grade classroom or as a graduate instructor of teachers, grading was always an area of displeasure for me. I never was clear on what the grade was to actually communicate. Early in my teaching, I had the privilege of working in an elementary school that was non-graded and had parent conferences as our only communication of the progress that students had made. Those conferences gave me a chance to talk with parents about their child's current level within different content areas. I could talk about the learning skills and work habits that the child had been illustrating, as well as their social interactions with other students. Very often, though, the conference ended with parents asking me that dreaded question. What grade would that be, Mr. Barkley? In an article in the Harvard Ed magazine titled The Problem with Grading, Lori Howe illustrates the problem with this story. Quote, my son's binder was a mess. Loose papers were falling out. Others looked like they had been balled up or stepped on, some more than once. The binder itself was bent in one corner, but he was a seventh grader, and to him, it looked just fine. Unfortunately, his seventh grade math teacher didn't agree and deducted points from his grade for being messy. The same teacher also took off points when homework was completed with something other than a pencil, or if the student needed a second copy of an assignment. If a student was asked to move their seat during class, she slashed five points. Points were earned back if a parent signed the list of rules and it was returned in a timely manner. Being organized and not misbehaving in class are skills that students need to figure out for sure. And I certainly wanted my son to be neater. But factoring those behaviors into grades, especially for middle schoolers just learning to come into their own, didn't make sense to me. End quote. Sarah Morris, a current doctoral candidate and educational writer, joined me in an earlier podcast describing the mistakes that she unconsciously made as a teacher when she used grades to gain desired student behaviors in her classroom. I hope this doesn't feel like a confessional to you because <laughs> every time every time I talk about this with people, I'm like, oh man, I'm catching myself in the confessional. But I used to be a teacher. I taught for five years, um, eighth grade math, and I was in a strong teacher prep program at a small private university. And my favorite class was actually assessment and evaluation. I loved that professor and he really made me reflect about, you know, what is a grade, what's good assessment, things like that. And then I actually got paired with a mentor for my student teaching placement who really made me think about the idea of a zero and a 50. And I took that armor and I headed into my first year of teaching job. And I was like, man, I am the best grader in this whole school. I don't (laughs) use any zeros. I only use fifties. I am so fair to these students. And oh my goodness. Now like cringe is the right word because that's how I feel about it. I 
used to do so not cool things for, that did not accurately measure students' knowledge at all, like at all. I think my worst offense was that I called them summarizers. Their summarizers, which was basically their tool for if they were engaged in the class or not, students either got a check, check minus, or zero, was 20% of the student's final grade. (laughs) Participation for if they were paying attention in class was 20% in their final grade. Like, And like, I still wore that as a badge of honor. I was like, if students behave with every single thing that I am saying, they are going to get an A. I even had new kids throughout the year come into my class and my students would look at the new kid and be like, do everything she has to say and you'll make an A. Like that's what my class was. My class was just behave and appease the teacher and listen to everything the teacher says and you'll get a good grade. Your mark of eighth grade mathematics will be an A if you are a good behavior or people pleaser. Like how bad was that? Like, ooh, barf, barf, barf out that confessional. Like I hate that for (laughs) me. I hate that for my students. But, you know, that, that makes you think how many other teachers across the country are maybe having similar experiences. And I know that nowhere in my teacher prep program was I told that 20% of a final grade should be participation. I know I wasn't told that, um, but I also know that professional development is a good thing. And maybe if I had experienced some sort of professional development on any type of grading practices, I could have took in some information and been persuaded in a different way, but nothing. I got nothing. In Lori Haug's article, The Problem with Grading, she describes writing done by Joe Fellman in a book titled Grading for Equity. She shares this example from Joe Feldman's work as to how equity can be lost when we build more student behavior elements into our grading. Here's his example. A student who writes an A-quality essay but hands it in late gets her writing downgraded to a B. And the student who writes a B-quality essay turned in by the deadline receives a B. There's nothing to distinguish those two grades, those two B grades, although those students have very different levels of content mastery. Traditional grading also invites biases because when we include a student's behavior in a grade, we're imposing on all of our students a narrow idea of what a successful student is. You start to misrepresent and warp the accuracy of grades. For example, a student who participates in discussions and always brings their pencil to class, earns points, but they get a C on the test. Adding the five behavior points lifts the C test grade to something in the low B range. Although students and parents are happy that the grade is a B and that the student's all-important GPA remains intact, this warping can create longer-term problems. You're telling the student that they're at a B level in content and they're actually at a C level. They don't think there's a problem. The counselors don't think there's a problem. And the student goes on to the next grade level and gets crushed by the content. They had no idea that they weren't prepared for the rigor of the class that's coming because they kept getting messages that they were getting Bs, end quote. Tom Schimmer, in a podcast with Justin Bader on the Principal Center Radio, reinforced this importance for us to stop and actually teach students the responsibility and work ethic that we want them to have, rather than try to create it by using the grade book. Here's an excerpt from that podcast. 
the grade book is not the only place that you can teach kids life lessons and l- help them learn to be behaviorally sound and appropriate and all of those different things. For some reason, I think it's low hanging fruit. I think it's easy to coerce kids through the grade book by threatening the lowering of a score if they don't do something. But as soon as you start using your grade book as a behavioral management tool, you've lost the plot. You've completely lost perspective on what assessment is supposed to be about. So doing your work is a very important quality. And I think that should also be reported on and should be honored. And we should let kids know that they have work ethic and that they are responsible and that they are setting themselves up for success. But the idea that a grade would somehow be enhanced simply because you completed an assignment, that definitely happens in schools. And it may still happen today, but it is just completely disjointed from standards that are quite cognitively rigorous the demand that states are putting on students, which I, and rightly so, in reaching high levels of intellectual performance is different than doing. So the two things are not oppositional, they're just different. And I think that doing your work and showing work ethic should also be honored, but separate from the degree to which or the quality with which you have met the standards. And so those are two different things. There's app, they're apples and oranges. And the idea that we would add points because you did something or deduct points because you didn't do something, regardless of its quality, in the achievement grade would be problematic for me. So, Tom, if I understand what you're saying correctly, you're advocating for separating the two a bit more than is conventional or traditional in grading. Okay. How much I know and when I handed it to you are two completely different issues. I don't know less because I hand you something two days after after you wanted it. You know, and Justin, this goes to a question that we have to ask ourselves fundamentally. And I know this is going to sound a little harsh and I mean to be so aggressive, but I, but in some respects I do, because I think we kind of need to shock the system. I often ask people in workshops, under what conditions is it okay to be dishonest about a student's level of achievement? And every educator will tell me never. Okay. And then I give them this scenario. A student submits an assignment to you and you judge it to be of an acceptable quality. And let's just use numbers for effect. A student hands you an assignment and you deem it to be a 70. It is of an acceptable passing quality. You know that. You've looked at it. You've examined it. You know it's of a passing quality. But here's the catch. They handed it to you three days after you wanted it. So you're going to reduce that score by 30%. You know the assignment is acceptable. You're going to enter a score that says it's not. It was a 70, you're going to enter a 40. So I asked the question again, under what conditions is it okay to be dishonest about the degree to which a student has met the learning goals? That's something we have to confront. This idea that the way we've always graded came first, therefore it gets a free pass, I think is something that we all have to question and challenge. This idea that we're just okay with distorting their achievement level. And it's really interesting because it seems to only be certain aspects of responsibility that we find most annoying. I'll often ask groups this question. How much do you reduce a student's score when they don't bring their materials to class and are unprepared to learn? Because that's also an example of being irresponsible. And the typical answer is, We don't. So not only do we cherry pick the behaviors that we reduce scores for, we actually cherry pick inside the behaviors. And typically it's the ones that we find most intrusive or the ones where we say, I told you Tuesday, how dare you hand it to me Thursday? You defied me. Therefore, I'm docking you. Now we've managed to couch it. I've, you know, after 33 years, I've seen the evolution of this. But When I started my career, I was the zero guy, the penalty guy. Like I was that teacher and I was intense and harsh about it. But you know what I didn't do? I didn't try to couch it. I just told kids, you handed in late, you deserve a penalty. Then toward the late 90s and the early 2000s, we started to shift the language of you deserve a penalty to I'm holding you accountable. And then we found a very clever way to couch this, which is I'm teaching you about the real world. And we've gone through this evolution of messaging just as ways to sort of soften the edge of what it is we're actually doing and the potential, I don't want to be alarmist here, but the potential harm that we may be causing to students in terms of how we use grades as a weapon. Deciding what we want our grading to accomplish is an important first step. And equally important is deciding what we want our grading to not do. I believe these are important reflection conversations that we should be having with our peers and instructional coaches and administrators in our schools, as well as being able to be clear with our students and their parents and caretakers. 
You'll find links to all the resources that I mentioned in the lead in to this podcast. Feel free to contact me with your thoughts, and I'd love to hear strategies you use to keep your grading delivering what you want it to deliver. You can always find me at barclaypd.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening, folks. I'd love to hear what you're pondering. You can find me on Twitter or LinkedIn at Steve Barkley, or send me your questions and find my videos and blogs at barclaypd.com.